at the NSF and also at the Lawrence McKinley Gaunt Professor in the Biology and Cognitive Science Department at Carleton. And uh, she's, uh, of course, been a member of uh, uh, many uh, national level committees uh, in the United States. And uh, particularly, uh, she's been the chair of the committee that authored the DBER report recently. And uh, uh, she's been uh, specializing in the undergraduate uh, education, uh, particularly, specifically biology, environmental education, and even uh, I was uh, stunned to see that even she's interested in other areas like sustainable energy and various other aspects of uh, uh, the STEM education, particularly at the undergraduate level. And uh, uh, she's going to, of course, uh, talk on a subject which all of you know because the abstract has been already sent to you. She's also been part of, uh, uh, you know, the, the entire uh, effort uh, in the United States in trying to see how STEM education actually moves towards solving the national problems of various kinds, uh, which could mean both the social, economic, and other kinds of problems as well. So she's been at the center of uh, STEM education leadership in the United States, and we are very fortunate to have you with us today, uh, Susan. So over to you. That's terrific. Thank you, everyone. I am so sorry I can't be there with you in person. Um, before we jump in, I guess I should add one um, brief biosketch update. Um, I am no longer at the National Science Foundation. About a year and a half ago, I started as Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Rollins College. So you can see on my um, first slide there that reference to Rollins. So I'm in. Um, Florida, which isn't quite as warm as it usually is this time of year. So in terms of my talk with you today, and I'm especially looking forward to the conversation at the end of the presentation, what I would like to do is two parts. One, establish the context and a little bit of the history of the undergraduate STEM education improvement effort in the United States, because I think a lot of what's happened um, informs where we've gone and how we've gotten to embracing Deber as a field of research. It's both a field of research and an area where there is great interest in using the research findings to improve um, the undergraduate STEM experience. So if we can go to the next slide. The motivation to improve STEM education has always been to provide really high quality STEM workers and a well-educated general populace. More recently, the um, scale of the global challenges we're all facing has really increased. And the, these are challenges that require a different kind of preparation to address complex, multi-dimensional problems. So to exemplify that, what I'm sharing with you here is an effort at the US um, National Academy of Engineering to prepare students to address grand challenges. So the National Academies, every 10 years, plans to introduce 14 grand challenges. The current ones fall into the four categories that you see on the left, right? So you can see we're talking about everything from clean water and energy with sustainability to delivering healthcare, um, addressing strife, inequalities. And I think it's particularly important that quality of life falls into their concerns also. <coughs> What's interesting, and I think will be informative as we move through the presentation are the competencies that the Academy of Engineering thinks are important for graduating engineers to have. So in addition to understanding the content, really being able to conduct research to have a creative approach to problems, to be able to address things in a multidisciplinary way, and to have a sense of business and entrepreneurship, because we need to translate 
the basic science and engineering work into the marketplace, the importance of cross-cultural competencies, and then the importance of social consciousness, that problems aren't solved in a vacuum. If I can have the next slide. Could we have the next slide? <coughs> okay, so what, what we need to do is to think more about educating T-shaped individuals that have deep disciplinary knowledge, but also the ability to work across disciplinary domains and have strong interpersonal and interpersonal skills. So things that form more, fall more in the socio-emotional domain than in the cognitive domain. And all that we're learning from Deber and from other fields is really providing guidance as we think about redesigning the undergraduate experience. If I can have the next slide, I, I want to talk a little bit about how we've gotten to the point where Deber has come into being. So. The next slide is very historical. I'm a biologist, and so I picked biology as an example. But for those of you that are physicists and chemists and chemists and engineers, please map your own discipline onto a timeline. Back in 1887, right, not so long ago, a biology was trying to make the case that they were actually a discipline that should be taught in higher education. So this has been a domain in higher ed for just a little over a century. In the United States, fast forward to 1958, when the Russians launched Sputnik, there was a huge shift in the US perspective and a deep interest in advancing science and engineering education. So you start to see a focus on an improvement agenda but you're still not seeing at the undergrad level the focus on research on how to maximize the learning. And by the mid-90s, the professional research societies had begun to recognize that they had a role, an important role in advancing the quality of undergrad education. This particular monograph was a group of, there's about 147 life science societies in the United States. Um, created a coalition of educators in life science, proposed a way to improve education, still didn't get a lot of traction. More recently, an effort called Vision and Change in Undergraduate Biology has very much taken the U.S. Um, biology departments um, by storm in a lot of ways. Next slide. I, I don't intend for you to read the, you know, all the details of this timeline for vision and change, but very briefly, this was an initiative that the U.S. National Science Foundation, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the U.S. National Institutes of Health supported and nurtured over more than a decade to bring together leaders in biology departments across the country to rethink how we educate our students in the undergraduate biology courses, as well as to provide tools, resources, supports, mechanisms to advance. On the next slide, what you'll see is a little broader context, because I think it's important to realize we didn't just wake up one day and say, well, we're not doing a very good job preparing our biology students. It's the you know, ethically right thing to do to get better at this. Rather, what happened was there were rapid changes in biology. Again, for those of you in other disciplines, substitute your own discipline and think what was happening there. Biology over a generation moved from a descriptive science to a very data intensive science. And students that were coming out with undergraduate degrees in biology were not prepared to work in the field of genomics or to do the large scale systems level statistical thinking that was required in ecological studies. So the, the field was saying, hey, we gotta do something, right? It becomes the workforce development 
argument. And more broadly, this area of convergence, it's a term that was coined in the National Science Foundation. It's one of the um, major points of emphasis right now at the US National Science Foundation is convergence. We can only solve the modern problems in health and in uh, agriculture and all a lot of fields if we bring together engineering physical science expertise and life science expertise and so in the vision and change document you see a strong push on cross-disciplinary understanding and simultaneously right that not just in genomics but in other fields we've been growing the big data data intensive research and that's important, not just for the disciplines, but I also think as we begin to imagine where we can go with undergraduate education research. So the, the third um, publication up there is a summary of two workshops we organized at the NSF to look at the future of data intensive research in education. And the one to the far right was an NSF supported effort at MIT with their online education to get them to think about ways that what was being learned about learning could actually be integrated into this large scale online delivery. So we've got three things going on here. We've got changing disciplines driving education. We have changing ways that we're educating students, taking advantage of online and other resources. And then coupled with those two, we have the opportunity to use data intensive research to more rapidly advance our understanding of student learning. So that's a little bit about the context, a brief overview, but let's now move to the next slide and jump into the world of Deber. So Deber rose out of the improvement agenda, um, but it, been an undergrad at a fairly late um, effort. So what is Deber, right? Deber investigates teaching and learning um, in the context of a discipline. So it's really grounded in disciplinary priorities, the worldview of the discipline, the knowledge that's important, the practices. Now, this this is a field, right, that pulls on cognitive science, educational psychology, K-12 science education research, which has been very robust since the 70s and 80s. Mathematical education research goes back to the turn of the last century. It's just that it hadn't really found its way as robustly into the undergrad curriculum. So again, in understanding the motivation for Deber, it's important to understand that disciplinary scientists felt that they were more likely to get traction with their disciplinary colleagues if the undergrad research became very specific to their domain and, and got embedded in their department. This is good research that it could occur in any kind of department, but in terms of the improvement agenda, the science and engineering department home base became critical. So this is not a field that's independent from all other education research. Indeed, it's very dependent on and should and needs to collaborate across other arenas of educational research. In the next slide, I want to make a case, if we can switch slides, that Deeper itself has actually become a field of research. So looking back at the emergence of science education in the very late 60s, 70s, and 80s, what ended up being more of a K-12 effort was actually quite groundbreaking because within the sciences, it was a break from a more generic, let's understand all education to the context of the discipline matters. Click to the next slide and what you'll see are some of the criteria that emerged from this analysis that Fenchon did on what determines 
a legitimate field of research. And so when the committee looked at the discipline-based education research area, the conclusion was that Deber has emerged, it's in the early stages, but as its own field of research. So it now has a lot of the structural criteria that you see up here in terms of academic recognition. Within the US faculty positions for Deber scholars have been created. Even Ivy Leagues like Cornell just hired a physics education researcher in the physics department. So that's a, a huge step forward. There are research journals in biology, um, CBE life science education is actually a very um, high bar in terms of standards for research that's published there. The physicists have been at this a long time. The professional associations have embraced Deber. There are research conferences. Research centers, I think, is still a bit of a stretch. And there is training. There are individuals that get graduate degrees and postdoctoral training in Deber as a field. Intra research criteria, you know, the methodologies and all are emerging. The emphasis on having a theory of change and understanding a theory for the field. I think in education research at all as a whole is something we're still working towards. Um, a lot of conversation work, but progress is needed. And then definitely there are outcome criteria that are emerging. So I think we can claim that while it's fledgling as a field, Deber is indeed a legitimate field of research. If we go to the next slide, I, I share with you from my colleague Carl Smith at the University of Minnesota, a really first rate engineering education researcher, a bit of a timeline to contextualize when Deber has really gotten legs. So in this timeline, and it, it only goes back to the 50s, right, the post Sputnik um, time point, the solid bars are where there's actual education research and more open bars indicate a commitment, a lot of efforts to improve STEM or um, aspects of STEM education, but not informed by research. So the most well instantiated field is actually the medical education research. And we often forget about that, but we can learn a lot from our medical education research colleagues. Chemistry and physics have the longest history. For more than um, two decades, there have been degrees, a limited number, but degrees, PhDs in chemical engineer at education research. Um, engineering, new to the arena, but has grown very rapidly. There are actually a number of departments of engineering education research in the US now. So hopefully that gives you a sense, at least of where we are timeline wise. So if we move to the next slide, I want to talk about some of the factors that have allowed Deber to advance fairly rapidly in the last five years. So this is a US centric story. Uh, but I think it may help you understand why things have moved here. And there may be things you can take away that you can translate into the context in India. So really, I want us to think for the next few minutes about the intersection of research policy, and in this case, federal level policy and funding. And I'll focus on the, the federal um, funding level, given my lived experience. So in 2012, two key reports were released, and they were released together fairly intentionally. Um, the former chair of the Board on Science Education at the National Academies, who had been involved in getting the Deber report going and all, was working in the White House the, um, at the time and was supporting the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology as they were delving into work on the state of undergrad STEM education. So the Deber report and Engage to Excel came out. It also happened to be the year of the MOOC, right? It's when all this hoopla was arising around MOOCs. Um, we're at a very different place now, I think, in our understanding of where online education fits. It's not taking over the world, but 
blended approaches have been very valuable and online is reaching populations that may not otherwise have access. If we go to the next slide, and I put a lot of text on these slides because I wasn't sure about the voice quality and all, so I apologize for the, the overly crowded slides, but I, I want to compare some of the um, key takeaways from the Bieber report and key takeaways from the Engaged to Excel report because the, the crosstalk between the two and what followed is important in terms of how Deber, I think, got uh, got moving in a fairly positive way after the report. So the report shows that you know we have pretty good evidence for um, students' grasp of concepts. A little bit less um, expert right now in how we get conceptual change to occur, although there there is research there. A lot of good work on helping students become good problem solvers, um, good research, good understanding of how we use representations in our different disciplines to help students learn. This is really tough for students, right? It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a shorthand that we use in our fields, but for a newcomer, not easy. And we actually know a lot about effective instructional strategies where there's room and there's been some work in the past five years but for those of you that are launching um deeper efforts there's a lot of space is understanding what works for different populations of students most deeper studies have been fairly small and the data was not disaggregated amongst different learners <coughs> Also, not as many long-term longitudinal studies. So when you think about system level change, you want to understand how student experience connects over the entire undergraduate years, prepares them for graduate school or work. Not so much interdisciplinary work or work bringing in the cognitive sciences. Deeper grew up within the discipline, so it's been very siloed in terms of disciplinary domains, and there's some exciting work to get out of that. There's a, a group of colleagues in the U.S. that are bringing together Deeper and Cognitive Science and another group, the Deeper Alliance. Um, you can follow them through the Trellis site um, at AAAS that are working to look at questions that are important across all of the STEM domains and how we can advance the field more quickly if we all work together. If you go on to the next slide, one of the key conclusions from the report is, you know, we actually know a lot about doing a better job in the STEM classrooms, but there has yet to be widespread change. And so the recommendations for the report were focused on how we bring about that change and i think the report wisely calls out multiple actors in this process you don't just go and say dear faculty member you know you need to change the way you're helping your students learn chemical engineering or um, geology we all need to work together and provide supports and we also need to change the reward system, at least at the major universities in the United States. Tenure promotion decisions are based almost entirely on one's research success within the domain. And there's very little incentive and often a disincentive to spend the time um, that it takes to change what's happening in your classroom. Now, if we go on to the next slide, we're shifting to the Engage to Excel report, the report out of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And you'll see there mirrored many of the things that came in the Deber report. So you can think about the Deber report as the research document and the Engage to Excel as the policy call to action document. Um, where, again, we know what works in classrooms, let's actually use that in the classrooms versus simply talking at students. The second recommendation focuses specifically on laboratories 
and getting more discovery based research based experiences into the laboratory learning for students and the third one you know my my sense in looking across different countries and all is this is a unique challenge in the united states but our failure to prepare students well for the mathematics that they need to go on in STEM by the time they get to college. And this was a point of great consternation for our mathematics educators who actually have a very robust body of research on mathematics education research, especially in K-12, but have moved quite rapidly into the undergrad arena. There is a new mathematics education research journal that's been launched quite recently, post 2012. There's a group call, that are call themselves transforming um, post-secondary education mathematics that are working very hard on um, national level change. There's work at, um, with both the calculus courses and with the getting ready for college kind of algebra statistics level courses, it's moved quite quickly. So some very, very exciting work in that arena. If we go to the next slide, a year later, the federal government released the first ever five-year strategic plan to improve STEM education across all education levels. Um, formal and informal education. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that there were four strategic objectives specifically for the undergrad community. And again, you know, as you look through those, they map on to what I was showing you in the Deaver report, in the Engage to Excel report, but the push on can we get these evidence-based practices actually used in classrooms um, the second one we haven't talked as much about in this particular um, convening this evening, but um, we have two-year and four-year colleges and improving the two-year experience and the transition between two years and four years emerged there. And then the other two map onto the undergraduate research experience and um, improving mathematics education. So in the next slide, right, you can have plans, you can have policy statements. How do you begin to implement them? So in the, the last administration, there were cross-agency priority goals. STEM education became one of them. And if you go to the next slide, 14 federal agencies worked together. I had the privilege of convening a, the agencies that um, representatives that were working on the undergrad strategic objectives. In the next slide, you know, a, a number of things happened. I, I picked a couple to highlight here. One was that across all of the agencies, there's all sorts of great research opportunities for students and funded research opportunities elsewhere. Very difficult for a student to access that. So we created a common portal. We also worked together on an undergraduate research playbook um, that captured the collective learned experience across all of these agencies. Next slide. And as that's coming up, this is not for you to read the details, but this is to um, foreshadow um, where I want to conclude with my comments um, a little bit later. As part of the implementation of this um, cross-agency priority goal quarterly, all the working groups posted metrics on their progress on the White House website. And the reason I raise this is it's really difficult to know what indicators one can use and what time frame is useful, you know, in terms of measuring change, right? It takes four years for a student to progress through an undergraduate curriculum at a minimum. And in many cases, it's longer than that. So we're going to come back to the indicators question at the national level towards the end of this talk. If we can move on now, I really want to shift gears a little bit. So next slide. 
I hope I've given you a little bit of the context of what was happening in the United States about the undergrad improvement agenda and how Deaver arose out of uh, an interest to improve undergrad STEM education, but is rightfully a field of research. And as the field matures, that can be a bit of a challenge because there is a difference between being an effective teacher and using the research that's out there and being a discipline-based education researcher. Um, so that's something that I think one needs to be very sensitive to and aware of. I think we also now are at a point where great, you know, Deber is launched, but we have to really think hard about the trajectory for where the field can go, what are the intellectually exciting questions, and also how are those questions aligned with providing information, understanding findings that will advance the, the quality of STEM education. So we've actually known since 1972 that actively engaging students in their own learning rather than having them passively listen to someone has a much greater um, impact on their learning. We don't need to keep reinventing that. We certainly need to figure out how to change that in the classroom. But as far as Deaver is concerned, we need to move forward. And there's a lot of ways one can do this. To frame it, what I'm going to do is draw on four recent reports that came out of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine through the Board on Science Education. These are reports that were commissioned by the National Science Foundation to take a committee of experts, really, really expert folks that look deeply at the research that's out there, synthesize it. And there's a very, very high bar for the research that is used to draw conclusions and make recommendations. So. The, the way I want to do this is first talk about the undergrad research experience, then talk about the, the and that, right, that was an area you saw was a priority, then talk about this gap that we have in terms of what works well for which group of students and when, and this shift that we're seeing in the United States from access for everyone to really ensuring success of all students. I'd then like to get us to think about moving beyond the cognitive domain. So there's a very recent report called Supporting Student Success in College that looks at the socio-emotional domain. What do we know about advancing and measuring student competencies in the intra and interpersonal competency sets? And then conclude coming back to this idea of how do we know if we're making progress and we can look at that at all sorts of levels but again at the na national level how would you assess the improvement agenda's impact so let's move on to the next slide and take a look at undergraduate research which for those of us in science it is it, really sacred, right? It's it, it, the apprentice model for preparing students. If we go back and look 200 years ago, Humboldt with his ideal focused on unified teaching and research. What's surprising is beyond descriptive research on undergraduate research experiences, we do not yet have a robust plus body of research on what works well for those students. So this is a very, I think, very exciting opportunity for Deaver scholars. And again, I'm not going to do any of these reports um, the service they deserve. I'm doing a very brief overview with a few salient points to the Deaver field. I'd recommend if any of these specific areas capture your interest or align with your own research, uh, you download the reports from National Academy Press. I've included the 
URLs, the PDFs are freely downloadable, and there's tremendous amount of good information, um, references, and analysis in there. What the report does well is point out that there are so many different ways we can integrate research experiences beyond the traditional summer experience, the capstone experiences, senior theses, internships, co-ops, which have long been common in engineering, cures are the course-based undergraduate research experiences, wraparound experiences in the U.S. are for students where there's a whole package of mentoring um, and other supports in addition to the mentoring for their overall experience, not just the undergrad research. Bridge programs for students moving into undergrad or moving into grad um, education. Projects, research projects that are coordinated across the nation. So there, there's multiple ones. There's an annotation project with um, the fly genome. There's a project where students go out and gather uh, um, phages from the soil and sequence them. And collectively, the data is shared. It's a crowdsourcing approach to addressing real problems in a meaningful way. And then more and more community-based research where classes, students are working in their local community using research skills to address relevant real-world problems within that community. If we go on to the next slide, um, one of the very helpful things the report did was try to define what is undergraduate research, right? Given that there's so many different forms it can take. And not all research experiences, the report um, states, need to have all of these elements, but many of them should be there. And I think it provides good guidance. I think it also provides guidance as one tries to frame research questions about undergraduate research learning. So getting students engaged in arguing from the evidence, generating novel information, working on relevant real world problems, mastering specific research techniques, and reflecting on the problems. And again, this is something that goes back to a much earlier National Academies report, but the importance of reflecting on your lab learning is about the only way we know students come to understand deeply what the nature of science is. Um, communication um, and then recognizing that these are structured, not free for all experiences and the importance of having a mentor as one is becoming a researcher. If we can switch to the next slide, and then we'll be past, I hope for a while, such wordy slides, my apologies for so much text. Uh, we do know that undergraduate research in increases graduation retention rates, especially for groups that have been in the US, at least traditionally underrepresented in the STEM fields. It may increase a sense of belonging, which has been tied to persistence within STEM fields, um, may increase confidence in the con understanding the content, doing data analysis, um, understanding the nature of experiments. One of the places that, you know, it's quite striking when you think about it, it's not at all clear that a very rich body of evidence on how students learn has in any way been applied to the development of most undergraduate research experiences. Um, and the published work that's out there has yet to really delve into what are the benefits to students um, in terms of their learning from engaging in undergrad research and which aspects of the experience are most expect effective in bringing about that learning. We also know that mentoring is very effective, but we have a long way to go with developing um, professional opportunities for faculty to become better mentors. There's some great work that's gone on at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, for example, but um, we need to spread that work to be effective. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the second theme, next slide which is how do we make 
STEM education inclusive for all students. Uh, the, this barriers and opportunities report is replete with data. Again, it's US specific. Um, to give you one illustration of that, the, the graph on the left is looking over time, literally over a generation, at the percent of 24 year olds that have completed degrees. And this is across all domains, not just STEM, as a function of family income. So for the highest quartile in terms of income in the US from the 70s to the present, we've almost doubled the um, degree completion rate right now it's up to about 77 percent for the lowest economic quartile again moving left to right on the x axis it's gone from six percent to nine percent so we've doubled the gap in who is earning a college degree in four year degree and there there are other um, groups other demographic challenges that we face and they're called out in the report so this this is something that is a key area of interest in the United States and again the report is very rich I I'm only touching on a few points that are relevant to this particular conversation but the committee concluded that the culture of many STEM courses and departments actually is undergirded by the belief that natural ability, whether you're good or not good at STEM, which we know is not true, gender and ethnicity determine one's success in STEM. And you can see how that becomes a very negative, self-fulfilling prophecy if we don't change that. Um, one of the other important things for us in the US is that the pathway to a degree is actually fairly complex. The average student is no longer an 18 year old and the majority of students do not go straight through four year full time and complete a degree. It's more like six years. And as a result, they, they talk about students swirling through degree completion. So as a result, STEM degrees often cost more for students and our large scale data sets in this country are just not adequate to capture the movement of students. Um, until this past December, we tracked through federal data sets only first time, full time students. That's expanded and there, there's still work to do there. If we go on to the next slide, parallel can we shift to the next slide? Thank you. Parallel to the work that's been going on and all the cognitive domain, the deeper work in the US, there's been a big student success movement pushing on graduation rate um, driven by data um, within institutions. So the growth in da data analytics has fueled a number of for profit. Um, consulting firms, I've listed some of them here, as well as homegrown efforts um, within analytics teams at universities to look at all sorts of patterns um, with students. Which courses are students most likely to have trouble with? There's some courses where, introductory courses, where the difference between uh, getting a B and a C in a course makes a 50% difference in retention. Um, there's a lot of work done with modeling with financial aid and who's accepted to colleges and then how that feeds into which students are most likely to graduate on time. Uh, really interesting work. I worry with any kind of predictive analytics tools that you can inadvertently disadvantage students by um, advising certain groups of students out of STEM versus really figuring out how do we focus on the disciplinary learning, um, not discipline, but disciplinary as in chemistry, physics, um, and figure out how we make our classrooms welcome and engaging for all students. So I think a very important area of research ahead for us is bringing together the predictive analytics related to student success 
and the deeper informed and more broadly learning science informed work on how to create classrooms that when we do the data analytics will be pleasantly surprised with the outcome. So let's move on to the supporting student success and looking there now beyond the cognitive domain at these inter and interpersonal competencies. This was a report that the Board on Science Education from National Academies undertook to do a number of things. But first they looked at which of these competencies there is evidence for um, correlating with college success and then looking where there's promising interventions. The overarching goal was to understand what do we know about the assessments we have for these competencies, how, you know, when do they work, what do they tell us, and what do we need to do to get better at the assessment. What's quite interesting about the analysis is where the data is, right, and we need to be very careful when we say lack of evidence does not, does not mean lack of impact, we just haven't demonstrated it yet. So if there are competencies like teamwork, for example, that probably you and I both believe are very, very important to um, students lifelong, except don't show up on this list, that might be a very interesting area um, to delve into in terms of research. So the three competencies that really rose to the top in this study and also have very low cost um, interventions that can be used at scale are a sense of belonging. So if you feel that, you know, you are part of um, the, the future of chemical engineering, you belong in the engineering major, or you belong in the biology major, you're much more likely to be successful in college. If you have a growth mindset, so let, let's think about math, for example, or the faculty, you know, in one of my previous slides that don't have a, acknowledge a growth mindset in students. Um, if you believe either you're good at math or you're not good at math, you're not gonna actually do very well long-term, even if you start out having a fair amount of uh, success. If you believe, if I work hard, I'm gonna be fine and I'll get there, it makes a huge difference. And also utility goals and values. If a student comes in to a setting believing that what they're learning and doing has intrinsic value in terms of the, where they want to go in life, they're much more likely to persist. Now, the, the remaining competencies on the list are quite promising. The research base is not yet as robust. Um, the committee called out behaviors related to conscientiousness. Conscientiousness is a personality trait that's not malleable. And certainly we need to be very careful about focusing on things where we can't change the outcome. In fact, conscientiousness is almost as good a predictor of success in college as one's um, SAT scores, for example. Also academic self-efficacy, believing you're gonna be successful at academic pursuits having intrinsic motivation or pro-social motivation, wanting to do this work, because think about my very first slide about grand challenges, that you think by doing this, you can help solve very important problems in the world, maybe water supply or health issues, and then having a positive image of your future self. Okay, let's move to the next slide. And talk a little bit about the research gaps. So I've called some of them out, but if you think about my list, not my list, actually the, the committee's list, none of those competencies were interpersonal. And again, if you go back to the beginning of my talk, the importance of individuals being able to work across multiple domains, working effectively, in teams, we know those are very important workforce outcomes. Why is this not showing up yet in the research? Maybe we need to ask different questions, um, but we also need to think, are we actually 
valuing this in the um, undergrad arena. Uh, more about community colleges. The research that I shared with you is discipline agnostic. So we need to know more about the STEM domain. So that's a great opportunity for Deber colleagues. And um, then we need better assessments. And the report does a nice job with that if you're interested. So what I want to do is wrap up with how would we know if we have, are successful. So the last couple slides, can we go to the next slide? Just, just released um, this past month from the Board on Science Education is a framework and goals for an indicator system. And so this is looking at a whole range of indicators that collectively will let us know if we're making progress. There's three key goals. So focusing on students' mastery of STEM concepts and skills by making sure they have evidence-based STEM experiences, right? So the theme I keep harping on, we know this from Bieber, we got to get better at doing this. Um, the indicator system recognizes that we can't go in and assess learning of every student. We don't have national tests in the U.S. So it's what they're, they were focused on is how can we deliver the experience. The second goal is focused on equity and diversity and inclusion. And the third is making sure we have an adequately sized STEM workforce. If we go to the next slide, um, whoops, did we miss one? But this is fine. We, I, um, well, this is that. That's um, yeah. There's one that somehow dropped out. No worries. So if we look at the model they developed, right? You'll see that there are a whole bunch of specific goals, including inputs, then looking at the actual learning environment, and then looking at the educational practices, and then looking at the outcomes. If so. Just having a model is a big step forward. Next slide. Um, I just wanted to show you what one of these goals would look like when you, you break it down. And again, the point that I was making in the earlier slide, that if we want to you use evidence-based practices to advance students' mastery of concepts, <coughs> we aren't going to, we don't have the capacity to go and measure their learning. So you'll see on this list that there's a number of indirect measures that can be used. And so there's some forward momentum there, an interesting framework if that's something of interest to you. And again, where I want to leave you and open up for questions is Deber is informing much of this work and its research that's tightly tied to practice and the big challenge is the translation from the research to the practice and to moving on and asking next generation deep meaningful questions in deeper so with that let's let's go the next slide has um just um opportunities ahead um it's, uh, it sums up the kinds of things that I just shared with you and may be useful in helping you think about research agendas of your own. And with that, I'd like to close and address questions, um, comments that you might have. The final slide does include my um, email address. If um, we don't get to your question and you want to reach out to me, I'd be very, very happy to communicate with you via email. So thank you much for your, your time. And let's take a little bit of time to see what's on your minds. Yeah. Thank you so much, Susan. So we'll take uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I look at that, the sun's coming up in Florida. It's not just a black drop behind my face. You can see there's actually light in windows. Okay, yes. And uh, so is it possible for uh, the, she can see the audience? Yeah. I can see the audience, Oh, yeah, yes. yeah you can see the audience. So and the Vita first and I one, practice, yeah, if you take okay. the microphone back, I, I can hear even in the back of the room. 
Yeah. So we should be able to hear everybody. Okay. Yeah. Yes, she. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this very comprehensive review. And uh, I think it's very useful. The resources that you have pointed us to are, are, uh, seem to be very interesting. Uh, I uh, just wondered, uh, you know, so you've been talking about DBER, uh, discipline-based, and uh, uh, but all the sort of um, pointers or, uh, you know, you, you talked about evidence-based practices, you talked about competencies um, uh, which are related to success, you talked about assessment. Now, uh, in all of these, uh, I, uh, it, uh, I was wondering where the discipline entered. I mean, uh, wha was there, you know, how is it that you, uh, um, I mean, perhaps these competencies or these evidences are uh, specific to disciplines or are specific to um, areas of particular disciplines. And uh, uh, I found it somewhat contradictory that you were able to draw such general conclusions. And so something is missing, uh, I felt. Yeah. Exactly. So this is a wonderful question. So let me tell you the story um, behind the Supporting Students Success in College report. When I was working at the NSF, um, we funded the academies to undertake this study. And what we were interested in is specifically your question. Uh, what do we know within STEM, at least, about these competencies? And what was fascinating to me was as they dug into it, we, we don't have the research yet that's STEM specific. So we've got some of these global conclusions across undergrad education, the same with student success, and we haven't dug in to ask, say in biology, right, we know you're not going to be able to work on any kind of a genomics problem unless you're part of a team, right? There's all the bioinformatics expertise, there's the molecular expertise, the, there's the specific organismal expertise. We know the team matters. Or look at the work with gravitational waves, right? That it's huge teams with different expertise working together. Um, and the, the open questions, right? And the way I framed this presentation was, I think, to be provocative in the way, you know, that I, I, I clearly have gotten you thinking hard about this, that we need to figure out where the disciplinary expertise is most important. There are things that are domain agnostic, right, that we can all work on. But I think for those of us that are in the science disciplines, we need to think hard about what are the priorities within our discipline? Where are these pieces important? We do know with things like sense of belonging for science students, there's been research done more at the K-12 level, but for women that come into science for underrepresented groups, things that you can do to help them feel like they belong are going to have a huge outcome on their success. But what does belonging look like in a physics learning situation? And how do we tie that to learning? Because I don't think any of us would want to spend the time working on <coughs> exercises that aren't also advancing students' learning in the field. So we've got a lot of context-specific work to do. So you are right. There's a real dichotomy there, and I think a huge, huge opportunity for us to delve in. Um, and, and I'll add one more piece. I don't want to give an overly long answer, but I think it's also very important for us to recognize that if Deber only works in isolation on um, just the cognitive piece of learning, and we don't partner with or educate others that are working on these broader efforts about what our specific challenges are, we're going to miss an opportunity to collectively do better work.
And I don't think that deeper scholars should become scholars in a lot of these other areas, but they need to be aware of them, they need to partner with them, and there needs to be better knowledge exchange. I hope that helps a little. Thank you, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the next question here. Uh, I have two questions, if that's okay. Uh, fir first question, um, you've touched on it a little bit, but I was wondering what is the state of the art r regarding gender? Um, if, if you could say a little bit about sort of what we know, or more importantly, what we don't know, what are the, the pressing questions that you think um, uh, surround gender in this field? So, you know, there's, there's many areas where this has really risen um, to a bit of a frenzy, a lot of attention. So in cognitive uh, psychology, there was a lot of to-do made about differences in the way uh, men and women think, and people paid an I think an undue amount of attention to mental rotation, the ability to see things in three and four D over time. I'm a developmental biologist, so you know cells morph in, in to new shapes and everything. Uh, of all the different ways one visualizes things, that's really the only element that there's some small difference and. Um, the National Science Foundation funded a number of science learning centers, one that focused primarily on visualization, Tufts and Santa Barbara. And there's lots of ways you can help people learn to do mental rotation. And to be distracted by that, I think, was really a challenge. Um, and I think also then we go, I talked about growth mindset, um, talking about about positive mindsets is really important. Sian Bilek, who had been at the University of Chicago, very good cognitive psychologist, she's now president of Barnard College as of this year, did a lot of work with um, math success and math anxiety. And it turned out that in elementary schools, we were doing disproportionate disservice to girls because most elementary school teachers were women and a disproportionate number had math anxiety and that got passed on and affected um, math anxiety and success actually for the girls in the classroom more than the boys there was a gender difference um, that we were were seeing there so effective practices like pushing for a growth mindset that if we all work hard versus gender biased um, messages are, are likely to be very important. In computer science, there's a, a huge amount of work that's gone on, right, because we still have so few women in computer science. And there the work was showing that classrooms that really favored um, problems, um, context, interests that um, were more relevant to the men and the women than the men in the classroom than the women was a detriment. Um, yeah, I would say I, I went to engineering school as an undergrad and, you know, I can still remember in a, a mechanics class being the only woman and they were talking about flywheel generators for those of you that didn't take apart carburetors and other things back when they existed in cars um flywheel generators were part of that well my, my dad had died quite young and i didn't grow up repairing cars and they're doing problems with flywheel generators and i had no idea what a flywheel generator was so i naively ask you know raise my hand ask a question the whole class laughs at me and the professor found it incredible incredibly funny, right? I hope this does not happen in classrooms anymore, but um, context matters and we don't all have the same prior learning experience, so being aware of prior learning matters. Um, where I could send you in terms of a really terrific resource is to go to the University of Colorado's website and search for strategic toolkit. Um, 
there's a really great resource that's up there and it's geared more at um, advancing the careers of women in the professoriate, but great lessons learned about climate in general, general. And this comes from a very, very good research study by Ann Austin at Michigan State and Sandra Larson at the University of Colorado of a whole number of advanced sites in the US. So advanced is an NSF program that's specifically focused on women and why we've had so little progress in advancing women in the professoriate and into leadership roles. And th this toolkit looks at, well, what's the challenge at your institution? Um, what are the research-informed approaches that you might want to use to address that situation? And I, th I think that's really useful to look at. And I think, you know, in some fields, certainly not in biology, anymore, but in other fields, having more women present as mentors um, makes a difference, and having more individuals of color as well. Um, so a, a sampling, right? There's a lot of research that's going on there. I tried to do kind of a um, sampler that pulled from a range of different areas to get you thinking. So that's a mathematician asking you this question. So. It's the issue of uh, gender in mathematics is becoming a bigger issue all over. I, I suppose that's one of the motivations uh, of having that yes. question from you. So if, if we are actually sort of already uh, just about uh, uh, the time uh, we have crossed about an hour, one hour that was allocated to this. If there is no other question, I can pass the second question to Manya. The, the toolkit, uh -huh. uh, you what want her to repeat, uh, repeat the toolkit. Yeah, what is the name of the toolkit? Yeah. Okay, it's called the strategic. The strategic toolkit. toolkit. And if you search, I'm, I'm trying to think of, you know, just verbally. The way I find it easily is to use a Google search and do strategic toolkit, University of Colorado. Okay, okay. Yeah. And Thanks. if you can't find it, please just drop me an email, and I'll, I will gladly send you the URL. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We'll, we'll facilitate that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there is uh, one question at the back. Uh, so sorry, Anya, I'm not taking the second question from you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Please identify yourself before. Hi, Susan. This is Max Das. Uh, I have been grappling with a grand challenge since your talk about how do we equip college and university level faculty to adopt those evidence-based teaching practices and become good at using them effectively. You have thoughts on that? I do. So one of the ways and in the US we've been pushing hard are through learning and teaching centers and STEM learning and teaching centers. There's a coalition of STEM learning and teaching centers that are working hard on that. Um, so that's one way to provide support to faculty. Um, the Another really beautiful program, uh, the Center for Integration of Research on Teaching and Learning includes 46 Research One universities in the U.S. and their goal is to prepare future, the majority of future faculty, because most of them go to a limited number, the top 100 universities in the U.S by preparing them as graduate students and, un and postdocs. <coughs> and that's been in place long enough that there's good evidence that those fac when they become faculty, they're more likely to use evidence-based practices. And they actually get their own research launch more rapidly because they're more confident in the classroom. One of the things I'm trying um, at my own institution with my colleagues is a little simpler and a more focused and it comes out of work that the American Association of Colleges and Universities has been starting to do. And that's to look at assignment design. We're actually in the process of hiring a new director for our faculty development center, our learning and teaching center. And one of the key things is to work across all the disciplines to help faculty figure out how to design assignment. So ultimately, right, with effective learning, you want students to be doing work where they're really engaged, they're challenged. The gap in their learning 
causes growth. It's not too big that they're overwhelmed, that it's not too small, that there's no learning. And that's a way we think we can reach all of our faculty in a fairly straightforward way. For us, the other piece of it is we've been using in our college-wide assessment, um, and we're doing this across the board, um, they're called value rubrics. Um, it's an abbreviation from American Association of College and Universities. Looks at things like problem solving, critical thinking, and they're rubric-based assessments to evaluate assignments. So given that we're growing an assessment culture that looks at assignments, by working hard on the assignments, the work that our faculty give our students, we think we're moving pretty far. And I, my current belief, right, and we're, we're testing this, is that when you have limited resources and you want to reach folks, um, by pushing on that, you may move things a little faster than um, some other ways. We also have a lot of other wraparound supports, you know, new faculty workshops, a series, regular meetings with new faculty, mid-career development, um, gatherings where you share information, one-on-one -on -one classroom observations. But I think it has to be positive. There has to be an incentive, right? We know a lot about conceptual change in adults. Um, and I think the other thing that is key, and the American Association of Universities, which is the very top tier universities, is pushing hard on this, is changing the currency of the realm. How do we change the way we evaluate teaching so that we get a good, accurate picture? And then how do we use that to inform tenure and promotion decisions because we don't change the reward system all the supports in the world aren't going to get us far enough it's a it's a big challenge but a good one and i think we're collectively up to the task yeah thank you so much uh, susan singer for taking time uh, an early morning day we couldn't offer you coffee or breakfast uh, <laughs> today uh, but uh, we are all heading towards uh, and a banquet, uh, the conference banquet right now. So people would have asked you more questions if you had joined us uh, at that time. So in any case, uh, uh, thanks again once, uh, once more for your excellent talk. And uh, uh, for the audience, uh, we have the email on the screen. Uh, so you can continue to interact uh, with Singer at srsinger at rollings.edu. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and you. I can Skype with you too. Take care. Have a great day and enjoy enjoy your banquet. I wish I could be there with all of you. I'll say goodbye for now. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Any announcements? So uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, pr uh, Professor Nagarjun for chairing the session. And just uh, Aloka will present a small token of appreciation. Uh, and buses for uh, dinner are about to leave. The first bus will leave at 6.30, uh, around uh, 6.40. And there will be a second round if you miss the first bus uh, in about 20 minutes. When is the second one? 7 p.m. Uh, yeah, yeah, around 7 p.m. Yeah. From where? From our institute gate. Near, you gather at our uh, HBCSC main, main gate. OK. And tomorrow morning, uh, we gather back at 9. I think we should have two seconds. <laughs> <laughs>